I think men and women get a bad rap when it comes to dating, mating, or relating these days. Uh, in many cases, men get a rat, bad rap that they're only in it for the sex. And women get a bad rap, I think, because they're only in it for status. And what I mean to say is a lot of people in the red pill community talk about the fact how many women only are seeking the top of the top kind of men. They're, they're looking for that Prince Charming, if you will, and they're bypassing so many good men. And I think uh, that's the complaint with men. And women have a valid complaint because men can be rather non-intentional, particularly in the midlife category. And for those of us in midlife, I always say it's after baby making years and before retirement. So why is it why is this worth knowing that people get a bad rap? Because the thing is, statistically speaking, let me just be clear for those of us again in midlife, the odds are against us in actually finding a really agreeable, a really compatible partner. The odds are against us. And yet good people are meeting all the time, falling in love, getting engaged, getting married, moving in together and that sort of thing. So it does happen. The question becomes not do you, how, it's not about you setting yourself apart from other people. I think the real issue today is being more realistic, pragmatic, and intentional. That's right. Realistic, pragmatic, and intentional. Now you might be saying, well, why does this relate to the topic? Never say this to a guy, five things guys hate. Well, we have to address the bigger problem in relationships to these days. It's, it's really hard to meet somebody that you're aligned in. It's hard to meet someone that you're aligned with where your values are similar to one another and you have lifestyles that can blend with one another. And certainly, is this person even emotionally mature enough? Do they have the relationship skills to be in a significant relationship? So if we don't address that deeper problem, it doesn't matter what you say to a man, you're not going to, you're going to find yourself going out on date after date after date after date. Now, what's the solution to all this? Folks, I, I scream this at my top of my lung. First and foremost, be your best self in the sense of recognizing that each human being has childhood wounds, they have traumas. And for those of us in midlife, we have adult traumas, especially if we've been divorced or have had several significant relationships uh, in midlife. All of those relationships come with them an unraveling of a tapestry of a life you might have built with someone only for it to fall apart. So if there isn't healing going on within that space, whether you're a man or a woman, you're going to come to the table already problematic in relationships. So first and foremost, as a woman, you're going to want to do some healing. Now, in addition, you're going to most likely want to find somebody who also has done some healing. Now, you have to be careful because while it's beneficial to go to therapy, and I'm a big proponent of therapy, oftentimes people still aren't actively healing if they're not doing the progressive work in between therapy sessions. That can be very problematic, but I don't want to get into that too deeply. What I want to address before we get into these five things men hate to hear is if you're a woman who has the capacity to attract men, and what I mean to say is if you have a plethora of opportunities, if you have plethora of men interested in you, and by the way, from what I understand, men swipe at 60% of dating profiles compared to women who only swipe at 5% of profiles. So if you are getting activity, it's more important to do a better job screening for these shared values, to screen for if your lifestyles are blendable, and more importantly, to ask some of the deeper questions to determine, is this person emotionally mature enough to be in a relationship? This is what I teach in my private coaching. I call it pre-qualifying your prospect. And if you need some support with that, here, check out the link to a free discovery call with me to see if working with a coach is right for you. And it's in the link below as well. Because the reality is, is you can have all the first dates you want or not, but let me retract that. You can go on first dates, you can go on second dates, you go on third dates, you can even find yourself sleeping with someone and, and ending up in a relationship only to find out that you're misaligned with one another. I recently got a message on YouTube about a woman who had an eight week experience. Saw the man about a, uh, a, about a do not a dozen, uh, about 10 times. 
about 10 times in that eight week period, only to find out this guy is really messed up. And she, of course, did get physically intimate with them. So I'm here to suggest a different approach than what you've been taught by others and certainly what others are telling you to do. Many of folks are telling you not to get serious early. And what I'm here to say is it's not about being serious. It's about trying to reveal, does this person align to who I am? What is the point? What? Guess, think about it. Dating is a period of time where you get to know one another. I think sex should be reserved for those in a relationship, but dating is to decide if you want to explore a relationship with someone, and that's the period of time you ask the deeper questions. Is this sinking in? Is this resonating? Please let me know. Okay, so what I want to share with you today was um, I saw this topic on another contemporary's um, uh, channel, and I thought to myself, what are the things I wouldn't want to hear, uh, whether it's in the early stage of a relationship or in a relationship? So I want to share with you some of my perspective, and then we'll go straight to Q&A. So some of the things men don't want to hear, I, um, I just pulled this up, um, and this is, this is a sensitive subject for me, because it's when someone said, my ex used to blank, okay? Here's the challenge. While I'm all in favor of talking about previous relationships to get a baseline to see where someone at is at emotionally, in other words, are they still emotionally tethered to a previous relationship? I think it's critically important to find out as much as you can about someone's uh, dating history and relationship history. But the challenge is if you share some of the highlight reels of those relationships, even if it's something that you don't, if, if, if your new partner doesn't do what someone else does, it can be rather intimidating for us men. And I don't mean intimidated. Mm -hmm. It just is that if we can't give you something they gave you. So for example, let's say someone in a previous relationship took you on a private jet and you went to Europe or something like that. Now, I know that's the extreme, but I've certainly heard that happen. Uh, certainly lavish vacations or whatnot. And if that's not something we can provide for you, it's going to be somewhat emotionally debilitating for us if we can't give you what someone else gave you. So I'd be very mindful when you're sharing about your past experiences, don't necessarily glorify any of the good things. Certainly bring up the things that that's, that's material to the relationship. I think transparency in the dating um, in the dating marketplace is all about sharing things that would be material to any new relationship. That's what you should be discussing about previous relationships. Does that make sense? Okay, good to hear. Well, you didn't say yes, but I'm going to assume you say yes. Number two, uh, if you say something, and I've heard this before, you don't understand me. You don't understand me. Well, ladies, first and foremost, we're not mind readers. But I know I was in a relationship with someone where she had said that not once, twice, several times. And sometimes you have to recognize we, we not that we're just not mind readers, but as human beings, we don't know the, the, the facets of all the experiences you've had that make you who you are. And when you do spend a significant amount of time, amount of time with person, you can begin to get them. But at some, but the reality is, is we don't necessarily an, understand it from your perspective. Let me give you an example. Uh, I was at an Alison Armstrong event. If you don't know Alison Armstrong, I'd highly recommend checking her work out. It's called understandmen.com. Uh, my website's Understand Men Now. Uh, actually, my website's my name, Jonathan Asley. But Allison does a little exercise where she asks all the men in the room, when was the last time you felt fear for your life? And they said, if it was in the last month, raise your hand. And nobody raised their hand. And if it was in the last uh, six months, raise your hand. None of them. I think maybe one man raised his hand out of 100. And then in the last year, it was maybe two men. In the last 10 years, it was maybe a half a dozen men that felt like they had feared their life. And I, I'm talking about physical fear, not the fear we feel like when we can't support ourselves or something like that. And she asked the women, uh, when was the last time you feared your life? Raise your hand if it was in the last year. 
all the women's hands were raised. And then I uh, said, if the last six months, all the women's hands were raised. If it was in the last month, all the women's hands were raised. If it was the last day, started to, the numbers started to drop. But then she said in the last hour, and 25 to 30% of the women still had their hand raised. See, we men don't know what that feels like. So we don't always, and I'm using that as an example, but we don't always understand what it feels like from your perspective, just like you may not understand things from our perspective. And so when someone says you don't understand me, that's an insult because we don't, it is, even if you've known someone for a year, we don't know how you experience the world. Only you can experience the world. And let me repeat, ladies, we are not a mind reader either. Okay, here's another one. It's annoying when you do that. Um, instead of judging the issue, offer assistance. Now, what I mean to say, it's annoying when you do that. So, um, you know, okay, I'll use the toilet seat because, and by the way, this happens so infrequently, but I will tell you, I get up in the middle of the night, I have to go pee, and sometimes I forget. Well, I'm grateful that Marie doesn't come to me and says, God damn, it's so annoying that you don't put the seat down for me, okay? Um, and, and, it, and that's just such a minor thing, but uh, it does happen. And she says, well, what can we do to, instead of accuse, coming at me with judgment or accusatory, she comes at it from a place of how can we solve this problem because it's kind of frustrating to me to fall in the toilet. And by the way, I think it's only happened once in the year that we've known each other, okay? But there's another thing I do that's annoying and sometimes when there's a disagreement between us or there's a, I feel criticized by her, I have a habit of doing what's called tit for tat, okay? I'm not proud of it. This was something my mother did. Um, it's, it's when I feel criticized, I get defensive and I have to say something that's also critical about them. And what I'm grateful, you know, is Marie doesn't say, you know, it's annoying when you do that. It's more, you know, how can we resolve this? What is triggering you? What is causing you to do that? And, and I'm getting better. I'm getting better at this. It isn't until I've been in this relationship have I found myself in this position of doing tit for tat because I hadn't been in a relationship in a while. So, I, so in relationship is when you actually start to have an opportunity to work on those areas within yourself, those areas of your personality that are somewhat, I'm going to use the word flawed, but it's not the best of me. Let me just say it that way. It's parts of my personality that aren't the best of me. And I have personality, listen, folks, so many of you revere me as like, um, um, you know, the quintessential guy. I am riddled with flaws. Let me just tell you something. I'm riddled with flaws. And even within my relationship with Marie, I have my um, areas that I'm not my best. And she has her areas of not when she's not her best. And when I recognize with that, I don't say it's annoying you do this. I just bring it to the attention and say, how can we overcome it? Okay. Number four, um, this is something that happened to me. I was with a woman who used to say, leave me alone, leave me alone. Um, here's the thing. When you tell that to someone, that, I mean, tell me, if, if you heard a man say, leave me alone, that would hurt, right? And that would be hurtful. I'm sure you wouldn't like to experience that. So instead of being confrontational, I want to invite, um, you know, just a simple say, you know what? I need a little space in this moment. Is it okay? And, and you can, not that you need permission, but is it okay with you if I take some space? Not that I don't have the authority to take space, but will you allow me that time to take some space? I think when you tell someone, leave me alone, and I see this happen, that's a very hurtful thing. I know if you'd experienced it, you'd feel that way. So I want you to be mindful of that as well. And lastly, and this happens to do in the bedroom. And I've had this happen to me before too. When are you going to finish? <laughs> um, listen, if, if you've engaged in the act of physical intimacy, but in that moment, you disengage. In other words, you are not engaged in the process. 
that's an insulting thing to tell someone. When are you going to be finished? I think a more, I think a better way to approach that is, can we take a break? Um, is it okay if we take a break? Now, some men are very single focused in the bedroom. I mean, once we start that mission, we have to, we go till there's a blast off, if you will. Um, but I think that's a much kinder thing to say than something like, when are you going to finish? Um, that feels that, I mean, certainly to some men, they're very selfish in the bedroom and they could really care less. But for men like myself that are emotional and that have a sense of emotional IQ, we may not be in tune to what's going on. And certainly it's, you know, sometimes in the physical act of having an orgasm, you can be self-centric. That's a very common thing, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're a uh, uncaring person in a relationship. But I think to say something like that, um, an easier way to approach that would be, can we take a break? So I could have come up with a dozen, two dozen things that men and women don't like to hear in relationship. I think the most important thing is I wanted you to approach this conversation from how can I say something in the most loving way to my partner? How can I say something the most loving way? And Marie and I talked about this in our most recent video versus accusatory and confrontationally. Okay. Ah, all right. Well, listen. I thought you got, I hope you got value from this. If you did, please post a comment below. If it resonated with you, please hit that like button. Please share this video. Please subscribe to my channel as well. And in the links below, you can schedule a discovery call with me, join my group and all that other good stuff. So it's time to take questions. 